is with Kyoku, page 35. Hue Feng was Tenzo when he studied with Dongshan. One day, while the rice was being cleaned, Dongshan asked, Do you sift out the sand from the rice or do you sift out the rice from the sand? Hue Feng said, I throw out the sand and the rice at the same time. Dongshan said, Then what will the community eat? Hue Feng overturned the bowl. Dongshan said, Later, you will meet somebody else. In such a manner, loved ancients of the way have carefully practiced this job with their own hands. As their successors, we must not be negligent. It has been said that, for the Tenzo, rolling up the sleeves is the mind of the way. If you have made a mistake putting the rice and sand, correct it by your, yourself. The Shingi says, when you cook food, if you intimately and personally look after it, it will naturally be pure. Keep the white water that drains from washing the rice, not wastefully discarding it. Since ancient times, we take a bag and strain the leftover white water to use it in the rice gruel. After you have collected the ingredients in a pot, you must be sure to protect it from old mice falling in by mistake. Also, do not allow whoever idly wanders by to examine or touch it. After preparing the breakfast vegetables, get together the wooden rice container, pots and utensils that were used at lunch for the rice and soup and attentively wash them clean. For all the various things, put away in high places things that belong in high places and put away in low places things that belong in low places. A high place is high level and a low place is low level. Tongs and ladles and other utensils should all be treated equally, viewed with a sincere mind and picked up and put down with a light hand. After that, put together the materials for tomorrow's lunch. First, remove with great care all the bugs, small inedible beans, rice bran, sand and stones from the rice. While the Tenzo is preparing both the rice and vegetables, the Tenzo attendant chants a sutra and dedicates it to Zhao Gong, the guardian god of the oven. Next, choose and take care of the ingredients for the soup greens. Do not comment on the quantity or make judgments about the quality of the ingredients you obtain from the director. Just sincerely prepare them. Definitely avoid emotional disputes about the quantity of the ingredients. All day and night, things come to mind and the mind attends to them. At one with them all, diligently carry on the way. Shuotsan, could you please read the definition?
次に今日、胎児に用いるところの参考書を作成して、関係なれずに流力したので、経営状況書に転換し、趣旨講座に案ずるきは後者に案ずる。経営に案ずるきは経営に案ずる。法事は公平。経営は製品に、それじゃ人を乗せ上げる。実際の目的、実況に達成して、新人に花を買う。定期に予報。しかし、手抜きに、命の再利を許し、まず、ルールに、のし穴を開く。リクルール、方言、お説教、平成に投げられる。米を米をやり、米をやる等の説。安全不良不正早朝に予報。次に、最高ラリー、熱量長文書。特に従って、家族するところの、それでは多少論理で、野菜を乾燥する。ただこれ、平成に論理するのか。特に、不動なし、次に両物の多少を取っとくのか。気もなく、無のとなら、物二つのところにある。孤立して、骨に合わせる。一等に他と、長文連絡。So, I think、uh, in the middle of these paragraphs, Dogen, Dogen、uh, more or less put、uh, two koans.、Uh, one of them he kind of quoted more or less、uh, completely, and the other one he just quoted one sentence and just made a reference to it, kind of. So, I'm gonna go back to the first one.、Uh, Which is about、uh, Hue Feng and Dongshan. <coughs> so, Dongshan made that、uh, weird question uh, if uh, he s i e f t out the sand from the rice or the rice from the sand. And、uh, Hue Feng's answer was also kind of mysterious. He said he throws out both the rice and the sand, but then his teacher asked, but what will people eat then? Then he just overthrew the,、uh, the bowl of rice.、Uh, and the teacher said, Later you will meet somebody else, which means probably another teacher, which actually happened. And in the other place of uh, uh, where there is another koan or a reference to it,、uh, it's where Dogen、uh, says here between quotation marks, a high place.、Uh, Is high level and a low place is low level. And if you go to the, to the footnotes, there is a small explanation here、uh, quoting the whole story where Dogen got this from.、Uh, the quotation mark on page 51 is like this. This quote refers to a story about Gingshan and his student Yangshan Huiji. Founders of the Guiyang lineage. Yangshan was digging on a hillside to make a rice paddy. Yangshan said, This place is so low, that place is so high. Yingshan said, Water makes things equal, why don't you level it with water? Yangshan said, Water is not reliable, teacher. A high place is high level, a low place is low level. So this is the The second quotation, and actually, maybe Dogen just quoted these koans in this part more as an illustration. Maybe also, it's not even the main thing that he wanted to say. I think he also used these examples just to show that the ancient teachers who were、uh, quoted in the koans they were tensors and they were like actually、uh, working. With their own hands. That was the first case of the, the guy who was washing the rice. So maybe he didn't want to say something specific with this one, for example, than just saying that、uh, ancient masters they, they actually put their hands in, in the kitchen and, and they did the, the tens of work. But however, I would like to start、uh, my talk commenting on these ones. But before I do that, I would like to talk about the interpretation of koans, which is something that, although I'm going to do it,、I've, I believe it's a more or less、uh, 
nonsense. Uh, the reason why is uh, I'm going to give one example uh, comparing koans to poems. So when I was in university, I, there was the the lessons, the classes that you had you had to attend. There was a must, but some others that you could choose. And the one that I chose was uh, reading poetry. I chose that because I like poetry, also because it was easy to pass, and uh, I really enjoyed the lessons. The, it was an old lady, the teacher, and she she had some good collection of poems, and she had a, a nice voice. Uh, when she was reading them and it was quite an enjoyable lesson compared to some other ones and uh, but the part that I didn't like was when she started to interpret the poems she would uh, say ah so here the author wanted to say this and I thought it was more or less bullshit because I think um, Poems, in the first place, they are usually made to speak about things that you cannot actually uh, explain. Otherwise, I think the author would not have used poetry, but prose. Poetry usually speak about things that are between the lines. And I think in many cases, even the author is not so sure what of what he wanted to say. Or maybe he wanted to say more than one thing or something that cannot be actually explained with uh, rational discourse or with normal words. That's why he made like a song or a poem. And uh, koans, of course, they're different than poem, but I think they have uh, usually a similar way that it's... Uh, they try to expose something that uh, uh, just a normal discourse or prose would uh, maybe fail something that's a little bit between the lines or something like this and uh, it's also interesting that if you read the interpretation of koans or poems like you're gonna get completely different uh, view from a different uh, author so maybe this interpretation talk more about the guys who are interpreting than about the poem it itself because it's it's something kind of obscure, like these guys just throwing the rice and I mean you can give many different uh, meanings depending on how you see things doesn't mean that that's what, actually what the guy wanted to say and said all that uh, I'm going to interpret uh, the poems the sorry the, the koan and I think these two koans, they could be interpreted as talking about duality and non-duality. So when the guy is washing the rice and the teacher is asking, so do you remove the sand from the rice or the rice from the sand? It was a question relating to duality. And uh, his students said, ah, actually, I throw away both. Maybe that's a reference to impermanence and to non-duality because in the end uh, you could argue that uh, rice and uh, sand are just different aspects of the same thing. Maybe it was a philosophical uh, explanation like this and, and, the, and the guy, the student, he, he made a dramatic ge gesture throwing away uh, the whole bucket with rice and sand and uh, and water, so maybe trying to show impermanence or non-duality or something like this. And the second uh, koan, I think uh, it's also related to something like that. Uh, you So there was a teacher and a student and they were trying to create a tambo, a rice paddy. And uh, so one place was high and the other place was low. And uh, the teacher suggested, ah, so why don't we use water to erode everything and make it only one level? And then the student said, uh, actually, no, a high level is high level and low level is low level. So in this way, maybe the teacher was talking about non-duality. Water can make everything only one, the same. And uh, the student said, no, but actually different things have different places. So here, he is kind of affirming duality. And uh, uh, yes, you could say in the Buddhist view that everything uh, is impermanent and everything uh, 
is equal in a way everything is one but also in my tensor training for example i was taught that we should not put knives uh, drying where we put the, the plus to dry because knives can fall and can hurt people so even though there is this view that uh, everything is one but also we live in a world of although there is the absolute we live in a world of re relative things so in this world of relative things to survive we need to know that a high, a high thing be belongs to a high place and a low thing belongs to a low place in this case it was just the knife and uh, but this is um, uh, a subject that is very interesting and i think uh, the ex another example do uh, dogan gives in this um, uh, part of the text can help us to go into these things that I think that the koans they kind of approach this duality and non-duality impermanence and cause and effect and so at one point Dogen says that, that nothing should be wasted so even the rice water that we use should be kept to bake the rice gruel um, and in the in the text that Shogakusan read yesterday, uh, in the version of this translation here, it, it's not said like that. Uh, it, it's translated in a different way. But if you read the translation by Tom Wright in the How to Cook Your Life, the book with the commentary by Uchiyama, in the, in the previous paragraph he says that uh, not a single grain of rice should be wasted when the, the tenzo is cooking, so I would like to get into that. In Nataiji we also have this uh, very very strong, uh, we learned that uh, we shouldn't waste a single grain of rice, Dojo Sam was speaking a few days ago about, uh, uh, he always speaks after session about how Dogen in this text also in a different moment says you should see the one grain of rice and cut in half and stuff like that so so there is all this talk in, in this uh, previous paragraphs about not wasting things that re reminds me another uh, episode that I, I experienced so in my previous Rinko I, I told you guys about one time that I was camping alone uh, for a few weeks on an island and uh, on that time I had uh, rice, brown rice, lentils, uh, olive oil, garlic, onion and that's what that was more or less my food for three weeks I also had some chocolate and peanuts but I, I finished them the first days and uh, so at that time uh, once I spilled the rice in the, in the kind of the ground of my tent and, uh, and it was so precious because the rice would be what I had to eat for those weeks and if, if I didn't have the rice uh, a, the, a boat came only once a week from this island where there was nobody to the main island so if my rice finished before the boat came and if there was bad weather the boat wouldn't come and I, I didn't I didn't have uh, I had 10 euros or something like this and uh, so for the first time I, I saw how important uh, a grain of rice is and that reminded me of one experience in my childhood that was with my grandfather in the supermarket and he was uh, we were buying rice and he got the bag and the bag broke and it was full of rice on the ground of the supermarket and my grandfather he collected every grain and I don't know if he took home or he for some reason he collected everything and I was very embarrassed I was like a child and my grandfather was just in the middle of the supermarket like sitting on the ground and collecting all the, gra the, the grains of rice at that time I was uh, kind of embarrassed I was a, a teenager and uh, but when I was there in the tent I s understood uh, my grandfather for the first time that experience immediately came to my mind and I was there in the tent and I was uh, running out of money I, I had a job that would start in one month but still like if I had an emergency I could call my family I, I'm sure they could uh, 
help me if there was some kind of emergency with it, which you don't have but my grandfather when he was um, a child he was the older brother of uh, a family of I think 10 kids or 11 kids and uh, at that time maybe his father was already dead and his mother was sick and he had to feed everybody and he told me that he had actually had uh, moments where they didn't have what to eat and uh, and so for him one grain of rice is was something really serious really important and for me it wasn't until I had that experience but we still was much lighter in my case than it was for him um, so I think this is one example of cause and effect uh, the I think his experience of taking care of the rice was because he was aware of uh, the law of cause and effect that if you don't take care and or sometimes even it's not uh, on, on your reach you can starve and um, you can yeah you can go through a lot of hardship because yeah not having food is really really difficult however um, Many of us here have not experienced that and right now in Antaiji we have uh, a lot of rice, even more than we can eat so even Sebastian was able to make uh, some sake no broku for the first time last year but uh, I'll go back to that later I would li like to give another example that uh, I think is related to this about I think this thing of not wasting is very big in Zen like we we clean our dishes until the last uh, drop uh, with the, the tsukemono, the pickles and uh, so yeah, it, it caught my attention the first time I went to a session uh, there was already this thing, you had to clean completely not no waste, even uh, I remember in the first place where I practiced somebody was drinking him and like going making a circle, not using the whole space and the person said some, in charge said something that you should not waste that space, you should use everything that you have, so you, you should have to make, to make a, a 90 degrees angle. And so this is very strong in Zen, and uh, another example is uh, last year I was reading this book called uh, Shine One Corner of the World. It's um, So this guy disciple of uh, the, the Zen teacher Shunryu Suzuki he decided to write a biography about Suzuki so he, he interviewed tens of people about uh, his, Suzuki's life and uh, the leftovers uh, of the stories that wouldn't go into the biography he, he wrote this small book which he, I was reading uh, called uh, How to no, uh, Shine One Corner of the World and uh, there are many funny, interesting, very short, small stories and I was reading uh, this book uh, during five day session in the, the breaks last year and there was one story that was also very related to this and uh, uh, it's more or less the following so Suzuki had this temple in San Francisco when he was already almost kind of old and uh, he, there was a, a fruit vegetable shop near his temple and uh, he, he went there regularly to get his vegetables and uh, one day he went with somebody else who told this story, I don't know who and uh, this person noticed that he got like the worst quality vegetables like the eggplants that were almost uh, not good to eat anymore, not the good looking ones as we always do, people usually do in the supermarket but he chose the bad ones and um, and then the, the old lady who was selling him the vegetable asked him so why don't you get the new ones, you always get the old ones and then he answered uh, but the new ones are gonna be pick, picked up anyway so in a way he was also trying to avoid waste he was um, just picking up the ones that people were not going to get and probably were going to go to the garbage and you guys may laugh at me but uh, it was like this is I was very overwhelmed even a tear came to my eye when I read that but 
Also, I think this passage uh, speaks a lot about uh, when Uchiyama Roshi comments on the on this uh, the Tenzo Kyokun, he talks about the, the three minds and the parental mind that's taking care of everything you encounter. So, I think when you take care of a grain of rice, you also take care of everything that you're dealing with because it's a part of your life. And uh, Uchiyama Roshi talks a lot about this. And it was interesting that more recently I was reading the biography itself that the guy wrote about Shude Suzuki. And uh, in the biography, I, it's, you, you get to understand this behavior by Shunni Suzuki, knowing more about his life. So when he was a kid, his father was uh, also uh, a Soto Zen priest, and he was from the first generation after the Meiji restoration of the priests who uh, could marry and have children. And in the Meiji restoration, uh, the, the, the Buddhists were kind of persecuted and lost a lot of their privileges. So Suzuki's father, he was more or less poor. And uh, so they lived near a river and from the river, some rotten vegetables would come uh, from other farms that people just threw away. And his father would get these vegetables and he would uh, cut away the rotten parts and maybe boil them so that they were more or less rotten and they would eat them anyway. And uh, his father would say, oh, they all have Buddha nature, we, we should eat them. And uh, so, yeah, I think this experience also is another example uh, and it made me understand the first story that I said. And so I think uh, in a way his father was talking about Buddha nature, which is not necessarily related to cause and effect, but I think uh, all of these are in a way related to cause and effect uh, because if we don't take care uh, we, of the food we have, we might starve. But not only that, there is uh, we have the, the chanting before lunch. Uh, are we, uh, would we deserve this food? And what about the, all the workers and people that uh, made this possible? So when maybe you are picking uh, your vegetable in the supermarket and there are you know, there are so many others that are gonna just get rotten and gonna be thrown away. You could think if you really want to go deep into cause and effect, all that happened for that vegetable to be there. In maybe a forest was cut down, uh, workers were working in the sun. We in Taiji here, we, we know how we work hard for the vegetables. So when you were Tenzo, maybe sometimes, even if you think there's more vegetable than you can, you can use, uh, you should uh, try to think that uh, we can do the best of it because it's uh, so many work, so many sacrifices, so many beings were involved in this. And okay, this is one side. This is the side of uh, cause and effect. And uh, But I would like to go to another side, which is the side of impermanence and... Uh, uh, emptiness, which is also very interesting. And for that, I would like to read uh, another story with also Gingshan, like, uh, but from a different koan. And this one is uh, uh, in a different book. It's in the teachings of Homeless Kodo, and who is talking about this story here is Shohaku Okumura. So, it's uh, it's the same, I think it's the same one, Gishan from the story of the high level and the, whole, and the low level. But here it's when he was young and still training. No, sorry, this is Shishuang and the other guy, his teacher is Gishan. So I'm going to read for you guys uh, from now. When he was young and still training, Shi Shuang became rice manager in the great Zen master Gishan's assembly. One day, Shi Shuang was in the storehouse sifting rice. Gishan said, Food from donors should not be scattered around. 
Shi Xuan said, it's not scattered around. He Shen picked up one grain from the floor and said, you say it's not scattered around, but where does this come from? Shi Xuan did not reply. Yi Shen again said, do not disdain even this single grain. A hundred thousand grains can be born from the single grain. Shi Xuan said, a hundred thousand grains can be born from the single grain, but it's not yet clear. Where did this single grain come from? Yi Shen la laughed loudly, ho ho, and returned to the abbot's quarters. Later in the evening, he went up to lecture in the hall and said, Oh, great assembly, there is a war in the rice. So, I think this story is, is very interesting because it's uh, showing to another aspect of life, uh, kind of opposite, contradictory to all that I said until now. So, the, the, the master, uh, Ginshan, was saying that uh, the same thing that we've been talking until now, the same things that Dogen just said, we should not waste a single grain of rice. But then in, his student said, but where does this grain come from? And in the commentary by Okumura Roshi, here he continues talking about this, he said, so what's the difference if a single grain of rice goes through the human body or goes through the body of a bird? So if we have leftover here, what is the difference that if it goes, we eat it or Maya eats it or we just put in the compost and the bacteria eat it? What is actually the difference? And I think this is the point of view of uh, impermanence of the guy who threw away the bucket of the rice and the water and the sand. And uh, it's interesting because I think both are true. Uh, in the biography of Shun Liu Suzuki, uh, his teacher, a guy uh, calling the book by So On, I don't know his full name, he <coughs> said that one, one phrase that really caught me, he said that uh, if you stick either to emptiness or to cause and effect, you are not a real Buddhist. I think he's talking about the middle way that Uchama also talks about in his commentary of the Tenzo Kyokun. So, if you just stick to one side or to the other, you are missing the middle way, which is not a compromise between both, but it's a, a way of living this contradiction, although it is a contradiction. So, I think it's, it's very, very interesting. So, in a way, it's true. Uh, the, I think it's very... A reasonable way of thinking, like my grandfather uh, getting every grain from the ground and Dogen uh, encouraging us here not to waste a single thing. And the, most of Zen practice is about that too. We, we hear that all the time. We, many of our actions or they are or should be like that. And on the other hand, I think this guy who was answering to, to his teacher asking, so where does the grain comes from? It comes from emptiness and goes back to emptiness and in the end uh, there is um, uh, water washes away everything and in the end everybody dies and, and what is the big difference if all this rice is just eaten by us or by birds uh, and yes I think this is a very pertinent question because I think we can benefit both from both views, from the views of cause and effect, if we are aware of cause and effect, I think it can help us in many ways. But if we are, are aware of uh, impermanence and emptiness, and we, we can uh, also benefit from it, I think. And But these are very abstract and a bit difficult concepts. And so Uchiyama Roshi gives us two very down-to-earth, mundane example in his commentary of the Tenzo Kyokun. And uh, I would like to talk about those and then also give some other examples. So, one example that he gives is this guy who is aware of impermanence. So, he, he lives life to the fullest. He doesn't care about anything. So, in his example, he, he drinks a lot, he goes out with prostitutes and... Uh, uh, because he knows that he's gonna die, everybody's gonna die, so there's nothing to worry about. But then according to Chiyama Roshi, this guy, he, he got some diseases and then he went 
out of money. He tried to rob a bank. He stabbed somebody, went to jail, suffered. And then so he was living according to impermanence, but then he was, he saw, he paid the price because of cause and effect. And there was this other guy that was living uh, according to cause and effect. There was a guy who really was working hard to save a lot of money uh, and eating very healthy food because he wanted to live for a long time. So he was living thinking about cause and effect. But then he dies in a car accident. So impermanence showed up because he... So he was focusing only on cause and effect and then impermanence came and, and got him. And uh, so I think in Nantaiji you can also have many examples of uh, these two sides of, uh, of life and different people, I think they tend to be more in one side or the other or in different situations, you can see. So one example, uh, so Shoko Mumio, he, uh, as everybody knows, he's, he takes a lot of care of the Zen garden and uh, uh, he usually, when he leaves, he, when he's here, he, he likes to, to work with some, usually some German guys because of the, he can communicate better with the language and he usually leaves some kind of German guardians of the Zen garden when he leaves so, so they watch and they know what to do and how to keep it and uh, so I, I saw him speaking a lot with uh, Tenkyo when, before he left last time and he was explaining everything, how things should be done, things that should be taken care of. And uh, yeah, I just noticed it. And uh, okay, so Mumio left. And uh, I think it was a few weeks later, me and Tenkyo, we were uh, putting uh, the wood for the winter behind the library. And uh, we were just stocking up the wood. We came with some cart and we have to more or less go through the Zen garden. And uh, there, were, there are those blue stones that Shoko spent a long time uh, washing and uh, he's, he was very angry at everybody uh, saying that we should not step on the blue stones and because they are not a path, they are kind of a, a statics thing. And uh, so <laughs> I was there with Tenkyo and then Tenkyo with his dirty working boots was just stepping on the blue stones. <laughs> and asked, do you realize that those are the stones that Shoko was telling you they're so important? said, ah oh, man, they're just stones. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I couldn't have but laugh really hard because uh, it was so funny that Shoko was so uh, taking care of the stones and so angry when somebody stepped on them once there was a little mound of stones he made and there was a step right in the middle <laughs> he, went, <laughs> he went crazy <laughs> and then thank you like in a very natural spontaneous yeah man just stones <laughs> and, uh, and for me this i think this is a very good example of cause and effect and impermanence like two different views so uh, shoko he was taking care of it because he uh, he was asked by Duchesson several years ago to take to create a Zen garden and he, he studied, he spent many hours doing it, he invested money, other money from Antaiji was donated and people spent many hours working there. So you know I think Shoko was right, like he he was right to to be protective about this because it's his work. But in the same way, Tenko was also right, it's just stones. And uh, but in a way there are stones that were uh, if you think about cause and effect, uh, they, I, I lived in a place in Brazil where there was a little mountain and, and they were using dynamite to like, basically eat up the mountain to get stones to, I don't know, maybe to make Zen gardens someplace as well, to build houses. And so maybe if you think about cause and effect, these stones, they came from donations, the they maybe destroyed the mountain, they killed birds and maybe a worker lost an arm so you never know cause and effect and Shoko spent so much so much time but at the same time Tenkyo is also right because we should not uh, worry so much about anything because everything comes and goes and one day uh, these stones will become some other the time will pass and they will get scattered and they become part of the soil again 
So I think uh, uh, we tend always as human beings to go to one side or to the other and uh, uh, it's, uh, but it's good if you, we can always see both, which is the, the very hardest thing. But another example was um, my tensile training. When I did my tensile training here, uh, I remember that uh, most of the guys they were very scared when they were tensiles. They were very scared, especially they were frightened of Dojo Sun. Uh, so one hour before meal, they were freaking out, and uh, uh, there was one tenzo, one guy that I always noticed that when he uh, he was tenzo, he was less freaking out and he was more relaxed. And I, th I thought that I saw how that could help him, how that helped him to, because when you were very nervous, you cannot really think well and you cannot uh, work well. But when you were calm. Uh, you can mm, see things more clearly and you can do things in a more efficient way. So, uh, so Fumon san, Fumon san, he was a guy, if we think about this type of views, he we could say that he was a guy who saw more the side of uh, impermanence or emptiness. Um, so, I think that helped him because he. He was less stressed and less worried. That was one part of it. And also because if we stop to think, uh, there was one. There is one Zen teacher in Brazil. When he gives talks, he usually asks the audience, uh, "How many of you know knows the name of all your great grandparents?" And according to him, never one person, unless this person is a researcher, a historian or something like this, people know the, the name of, uh, of their ancestors even like two or three generations ago. So he's, he does that to show that uh, we are going to die and we all are going to be forgotten very soon. So what is that impermanence and that's uh, the emptiness. We all came from some emptiness and we're going to all go back to it and nobody's going to remember us so what is the the point of worrying so much and having so much fear and, and focusing so much on your personal problems and i think uh, buddhism it's uh it's not something from another world it's something that uh, humans can what we call the, the noble truths or the the, the, the buddhist um the, the, the paths, the eightfold path, many of these things, I think people observing life, observing nature, more or less intuitively, they can see that. So one example, when I was a child, sometimes when I had some problem, if I was sad or something, I could just look in the sky and everything looked so big that uh, all my small human problems seemed so insignificant. And uh, I think what this Zen teacher from Brazil is saying is the same, he's trying to show the same thing. Uh, also, when I was a teenager and I wanted to talk with a girl that I liked, something very hard, but I, I tried to convince myself, to give myself courage, thinking that uh, me, her, everybody around, and even the baby who was born in, at that moment, in 100 years, would be dead. So, what's the problem of. Uh, worrying and I don't know maybe Docho san he he wrote several books and he's part of a lineage that is recognized so maybe he will be remembered for a few generations Chogaku san uh, he hasn't written anything yet but in the case he comes to write a book maybe the new Shobogenzo in that case Chogaku san would be known maybe for 1000 years <laughs> but even Docho san and even Shogak san, after 1000 years, uh, everybody would be forgotten because there's a poem that I like a lot of a Portuguese uh, writer. He says something about even the language that the poem is being written and uh, is going to become a dead language and the, the human race is going to disappear and the planet is going to disappear. So, why to be so much afraid when you were Tenzo and even if Docho-san criticizes you or Timmy or yells at you, like, 
uh, everybody's going to die and even them are going to be forgotten one day too. So I think uh, uh, from Fumonsan, we had the, I had this I saw this side a guy that was less worried about uh, and less anxious and I think that's uh, the side of uh, seeing impermanence. But as in the guy in the example uh, in the book that uh, uh, which Amaroshi said, if you only aware of impermanence, you're gonna there. There's, there are chances you're going to become reckless with other things. So when Fumonsan was the main tenzo, I think it's hard to think of a worse main tenzo because things were getting rotten, like uh, the bugs were eating the whole storage room. And um, so I think also that's the reason why Zen sometimes is a little bit uh, military and a little bit uh, going to... Um, trying to bring us to down to earth and to, because Zen has this philosophy behind it in the Heart Sutra it's also said that uh, to be aware of impermanence is to have no fear to be aware that uh, all the the aggregates are empty, empty. it become you, you have no fear because there is nothing actually really with substance that can judge you or can harm you and even yourself you don't have a, a substance so but when you have that kind of uh, philosophy behind you it's very easy to get reckless or to get responsible and uh, uh, so I think that's why also Zen has this kind of uh, approach that tries you to bring to daily life and to things that are very practical and Ducha Sanalis tells us that uh, Enlightenment is not uh, Zazen, but playing the tools and, and things like this. So I think that ex explains how Zen maybe also, because it's not only about emptiness, but it's about the middle way. It also tries to bring this side of cause and effect. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the opposite of Fumonsan is Ekosan. I think Ekosan is uh, is the champion here of these things, of uh, uh, really not trying to waste things and to um, trying to do things in the, in the right way. And um, it's interesting because when you you have different people, you can also learn different things from different people. So I tend to be more the lazy side of uh, Kumonsan, like trying to do things the easy way. And then sometimes uh, I remember me and Ekosan had a small argument in December and she said, ah, but if I don't do what I have to do, this place it doesn't have a real practice. So she also brings me a little bit more to the other side. But there's also the, the, the side that if you are too focused on cause and effect, uh, the problem is that it might uh, bring you a lot of stress because so you see cause and effect and, uh, and then you don't see much impermanence and one thing you try to make the circumstances work like Shoko for example uh, with the, the stones uh, but some things that are beyond your reach uh, there are people that are you cannot control so I think that's also why there was a lot of fights between Ekosan and Fumonsan last year because they represent opposite sides and um, when you see cause and effect and you want everything to to be right but we cannot actually make much because we're very small parts and other people think and, and work in different ways so uh, I think this view that we when we try to see both it's, uh, it's the hardest thing but it's uh, uh, it's it's a good uh, good thing to look for to try to to be aware of these two aspects and uh, one another story that I, I think it's uh, interesting that uh, is related to all this it's in the Bible it's in the New Testament uh, in the Gospel of Luke it's a story that I really like. And it's the story of uh, two sisters, Martha and Mary. So Jesus was just uh, 
walking somewhere with his disciples and uh, he ha happened to be hosted and uh, uh, by this family of uh, where there were two sisters in the house so the gospel goes like this as Jesus and his disciples were on their way he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And then Jesus, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be not in end, it will not be taken away from her. So this is the, the quote from the Bible, and I, I'm reading from the Wikipedia article, and there is the next section is called interpretation. So I'm going to read the interpretation from Wikipedia. Mary, Mary chose listening to the teachings of Jesus over helping her sister prepare food. Jesus responded that she was right because only one thing is needed. One thing apparently meaning listening to the teachings of Jesus. This goes in line with words by Jesus that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, meaning eternal life. To simplify it, this is frequently interpreted as spiritual values being more important than material business, such as preparation of food. It's very interesting because uh, Tenzo Kyokun is exactly about preparation of food. And here it's saying that uh, Mary was wiser because she was just lit, uh, sitting by the, uh, the uh, feet of Jesus and getting wisdom. And while her sister was all stressed trying to cook and to prepare a table setting and uh, and she was so focused in that she couldn't hear the wisdom and uh, i think uh, if that if jesus was a zen master maybe he would have praised uh, more martha or i don't know but i think it's it's very interesting because i think what dogen is saying in this paragraph that I said is that uh, actually listening to what is most important to the wisdom and preparing the food they don't necessarily need to be opposite they are two different aspects that can be put together and I think that's the most interesting thing that Dogen is doing here also it's a way his uniting cause and effect and also impermanence or the wisdom and the practical uh, side of life he's putting them all together saying that when you were tenzo you were practicing the way uh, when you were preparing food so he's not trying to separate the mundane from the spiritual he's trying to bring them both together and i think that's the the most uh, interesting thing of this paragraph Although I also really like this story and sometimes I prefer to be just like uh, 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 Mary and just to uh, enjoy the wisdom. But I think Dogen is also, I need him because he, we also need to cook and things like that. And it's really hard to bring that wisdom to all the moments when we're doing practical things. But it's, uh, it's a good goal because we spend most of our lives not doing Zazen or having some kind of wisdom, but actually doing practical things. And uh, to close up, uh, uh, there's another story. Uh, it was last year, beginning of last year. So me, Taiga and Martin, who's was a German Polish guy. Uh, we were asked to bring some logs from beyond the fence somewhere that it's yeah by walking to I don't know 10 15 minutes and we went there with the car and some logs that somebody had cut I don't know one or two or three years before and they were really down a hill and uh, uh, 
it was a very complicated job because the logs were really heavy and uh, we couldn't it was almost impossible or probably impossible to bring them up the hill and uh, we could cu cut them with the chainsaw uh, and then bring them with the chainsaw uh, after they're, they're cut but uh, it, it seemed to us kind of uh, like a nonsense because it, it would take so much time to cut that small piece of log it would take maybe as much time as to cut a big tree and I don't know if you guys had seen uh, the the cartoon from the 80s called uh, Dragons and Dungeons it was very popular in Brazil and uh, there was a, a master like a, a small guy that appeared sometimes it called his name was Dungeon Master and he always like gave some tips how to solve a problem and he just appeared out of nowhere and Dojo san sometimes is like that when you least expect he just comes and and then <laughs> Uh, he showed us one possible solution to this problem he said well you can either cut the the log or actually here this place was an old hatake if you notice a bit plain and there was kind of like a hidden road uh, from this hatake to the to the main road it was not so how do you say it so steep so we could maybe push it in three people and and then he just disappeared as quickly as he appeared <laughs> and uh, but then we we had this new option we have this new uh, solution we didn't imagine before so we so then we started we were going to start pushing and then we were looking at each other can we really do it and then Tagasan said zen mind just do it and then martin said no that's actually nike the shoes and uh <laughs> So yeah, I think Martin was right. It was Nike, but Tagasan was always right. Like we didn't think much and we just did it and it was not so bad in the end. We, we were able to get the log. And uh, just to close up, I think that, uh, so I spoke about many, I made many analysis here and also because I have to speak for at least one hour and because I like analyzing things. But I think this chapter uh, can also be seen through a very simple light uh, Dogen says to the work of the Tenzu is just like putting up their sleeves and uh, there are some other cool sentences that he says here that are very practical and very clear uh, all day and all night things come to mind and the mind attends to them at one with them all diligently carry on the way and uh, also another part Tongues and ladles and other utensils should be all be treated equally, viewed with a sincere mind and picked up and put down with a light hand. So Shogakusen last uh, in his talk yesterday, he said that uh, we can see uh, the work of the Tenzo as Zen practice and then it becomes uh, maybe less difficult because it's your practice and you can, but you can even maybe try to forget that and just pick up things with a light hand and just do it and uh, so you, you don't need all this philosophy behind if you are able to do things in a natural way just being aware of them and uh, just uh, yeah just doing it yes are there any questions comments I don't know if you can find it on the internet, but there's a famous mystic who lived about the time in, in, of Dogen in Germany, Meister Eckhart in, in German. I don't know how you say it in English, maybe Master Eckhart, maybe Meister Eckhart. And he also comments on that story from the Bible uh, with Martha and Mary. And you would think that also a mystic kind of would agree that there are more important things than cooking, that uh, you want to become one with uh, gods and things. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Meister Eckhart, uh, he says, well, of course, Jesus wasn't wrong, but also Martha, she, ha she has a point that um, you can't live from bread alone, but you can't live from the word of God alone. I mean, or if you listen to the word, you also need to express it in life. And that's what Martha was doing there, actually. But when she was cooking, it wasn't worse than 
sitting at the foot of the guru and just said, wow, what's he, what's he saying? But the, she was actually doing the work and making sure that the guru and all the listeners had something to eat. So it's interesting, like maybe you can find it in the internet that uh, what Eckhart is, it's only a short comment that he's making, but basically what you said, a Zen master would have said, well, Martha also has a point there.